Welcome to another edition of Leading and Growing Your Real Estate Business. Coach James Short here, aka Shorty. And do we have a guest for you, ladies and gentlemen? Oh, I have known this guy. I'm trying to work it out before we jumped on for over 20 years. We were introduced uh, together by a mutual friend, David Gray. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, having a chat with this gentleman because he is a wealth of knowledge. He's a bit of a character, so I don't know where this is going to go, but let's uh, let's introduce Stuart Ritchie. He's a family man living in the St. George area of Sydney, where he was born and raised. He has a Bachelor of Land Economics from the UTS with experience in property development, valuation, and portfolio management. Now, he's been an auctioneer for 13 years with over 4,000 real estate auctions, plus over 100 jewelry and watch auctions conducted in that time. He's a busy man. He's the two-time McGrath auctioneer of the of the year he's the two-time rei new south wales auctioneer of the year including drum roll 2023 he was nominee for the reb australian auctioneer of the year in 2024 he's exclusive mcgrath auctioneer for 12 years now he's partner of mcgrath auctions and he's the owner of bolarama in wetherill park let's uh let's get him on the call on the show today Mate, Stu, so good, buddy, to have you on here. Thank you. That's some introduction, mate. I might have you walk around with me as I meet people. That'd be a good, uh, <laughs> drum roll here and a drum roll think, there. Yeah. A nice little, just just a bit of a hype man uh, to get me going. But, mate, nice to see you. Uh, and you're right, it is it somehow been over 20 years, so uh, time flies. You're having fun. Incredible, mate. So let's get let's go back to the beginnings of before 13 years ago. Why Why auctioneering? How did that happen? Uh, yeah, well, as you mentioned, our mutual mate, uh, Dave Gray, who was an agent I met when I was working in development over in the East, and uh, he was an auctioneer, and for a little while he was trying to tip me into getting involved in it, you know, and, and we knew him for a long time, and he was doing it, and he said, oh, mate, I reckon you'd be all right at this, and sort of nudged me along, and at the time I had, had a couple of bowling alleys and was a bit busy on the weekend, and so he went and, um, unbeknownst to me, entered me in the novice auctioneers competition, this is back in maybe 2010, uh, he basically rang me on Tuesday and said, right, what are you doing tonight? We're heading over to Double Bay during this competition. So I did a little bit of practice and the competition went well and and then just got an sort of a introduction to it from there, got a couple of job offers off the back of that and uh, floated around for 12 months or so before sort of fortuitously landing in with McGrath. Oh, that's so good. And, and, and so if you look at the auction process, because, you know, depending on, I think, also location, depending on where you're at around Australia, but why do you believe auction is the, the best method of selling? I, I think primarily, you know, I really like the transparency around it, you, you know, and, and that's for all parties involved. You know, it's transparent for the bidders who can see the other person across from them in the yard, you know, bidding away. It's transparent for the owners that are not just taking the agent's feedback on what people are saying and what they think it's worth and the rest of it. Um, you know, it gives us a good chance to put everyone together. In, like I said, an environment where everyone can see what's happening and, um, in our experience, there's just so many positives behind it as well. You know, I mean, it's it's a very time efficient process to get property sold, gets everyone to the finish line at the uh, the same time, and also just a wonderful marketing tool for an agent. You, you know, in their core area to have a, a front yard full of people and, and, and a great auction. Uh, you know, all of those people in those crowd are going to be vendors at one stage, and they will all sit back and judge and watch what happens. And you know, we sort of call it the ultimate listing presentation. Is a you know. It, it's just a great auction. Yeah, I love that. And, and there's so many different different factors around that. And and as you said, there's the timeline, there's the expectations. It's like putting in everyone in the room so the the market actually tells you where where it all is. And looking at the process around the agents got their role, the auctioneers got their role. But what specifically is the auctioneer's role in the sales process? Let's unpack that for a minute. Yeah. So look, it's you know I think. Of, I read statistically the auctioneer is typically only involved in the last 2% of the process. You know, 98% of the sales process runs through uh, before auction day. Um, but it's not, it's important to not underestimate, you know, the value that the auctioneer can provide in being viewed as a sort of independent third party expert. You know, so for example, in my area, I, I auction predominantly in the St. George area, um, have done for over a decade. And so agents, vendors, buyers you know that they know you as a person in that area you've got expertise in that area so when you're having a conversation with whether it be a seller or a buyer and you were giving them 
up-to-date information. This is what's happened this week. So far today on Saturday, this is what we've seen. This is what we've seen in the last couple of weeks. It does come from a, a position of sort of authority in that regard. And particularly to owners, you know, knowing that you don't have a financial interest in the outcome so far as they pay you to come and be their auctioneer, but, you know, it's not commission-based. You don't get more or less whether it sells or not you know, that we're in a position to give them what's viewed as some quite independent advice. So so that's one area that I think can be a little bit understated sometimes. Now, equally, we run plenty of auction processes where my role is just, you know, quick hello to the vendors and we go out and call the auction. And that's its own sort of area to unpack. But, you know, there are many occasions where the involvement of the auctioneer in a discussion, and I'll generally call the vendors upon listing, you know, welcome them, invite them to come and watch some auctions during their own campaign so they can get a bit of a feel for what's happening, speak to them again the day before the auction to unpack the campaign, what we're expecting to see the following day because we have a real mantra about there being no surprises. You know, everything that should unfold is, is exactly as we see. Um, and then when push comes to shove, of course, the auction itself is, is you know, just vitally important and, you know, an agent can do an, an amazing job and if the auctioneer is off their game, it's not going to present well to the marketplace. And, you know, some auctioneers can impact whether a property sells or not. But generally speaking, that result will naturally run itself through. There are some auctions that, that Blind Freddy could do, no problem. But there is certainly a percentage of auctions where the auctioneer is going to have a tangible impact on the result. You know, the difference between an average auctioneer, a good auctioneer and a great auctioneer, you know, directly affects the income and the outcome. And, and not, not everyone can see that, you know, but the people who see it, you know, really place a lot of importance on it. I just want to grab that, like the difference in auctioneers. What do you think and what do you see because you're an expert, because you've done over 4,000 auctions, you've been around for 13 years doing it. What do you see the difference between a good auctioneer and a great auctioneer? I think the large majority of auctioneers operating, and I guess I speak particularly around Sydney, but of course, you know, all over the country, you know, are, are professional auctioneers, people that know what they're doing are able to legally run an auction process and, and call the bids and do those sort of things. For me, the difference is, you know, just in the last part of the auction, you know, when say you're on the market and, and you're above and, and, and you've achieved what looks to everyone to be a pretty good result. And then there's an underbidder who you can see are hurting. You can see they've probably reached their limit. And deep down, they want to bid again. They really do. But they've, they've said, no, we're out. We can't do it. We can't do it. That's when the auction begins. That's when a great auctioneer will take it upon themselves to change their mind and to give them, because they want to bid again. They want to buy it. They really do. So you're actually helping them make the decision that they want to make. But because they've spoken to friends and family and the rest of it said, no, we're not going to bid above this. We're not going to do that. You're actually helping them to, to do what they want to do, which is to buy the property. But, you know, to have those uncomfortable conversations in that moment when you are under pressure from the highest bidder who desperately wants you to knock it down to them to sell it. You know, I always say there's no correlation between a, a, a quick auctioneer and a good auctioneer. You know, there are moments where you need to take time and you need to give someone the opportunity and, it all comes down to dialogue and the way you, you speak with people, negative language versus positive language, rather than saying, are you out? What about, can I tempt you back in? Surely it's worth another shot. You've got everything to gain and nothing to lose. Just some, some things that resonate with people and to open the door for them to walk through, say, right, let's go again. And sometimes it can be one bid. And sometimes that one bid can lead to 30 bids and, and a real you know, life-changing result for our, our owners who invariably we're working for there. But that, that's where I would identify as the difference. I'd be the first to put my hand up and say that I am not a, a really great uh, first half auctioneer so far as my terms, my conditions, they're fine. My descriptions, I'm not the most uh, elaborate guy around in that regard. But no one remembers any of that when everybody else in the yard at the end of an auction has stood there and gone, they got every single bid possible. Every single dollar has been taken out of that process and no one remembers whether you were very, uh, you know, descriptive when talking about the local cafe and this and that, the other. For me, that, that's, it, it all happens in that, in that second part. I love that. I love the linguistics around it. I love the language. I love the, the metaphors that you use around taking them on that journey because they only know and you can see what's going on in their mind and actually taking, holding their hand and, and cause they know, right. They know they want to get it, but it's just like mm. oh, all that other internal dialogue that they've had from, you know, uncle Bob and, you know, Terry down the road and 
blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It's um, it, it can hold them back. Now, the, the, there's an important dialogue that and a relationship that happens at an auction, before an auction, during an auction with an agent and an auctioneer. What's what's the importance around that relationship and and what should an agent look for to develop that that relationship with an auctioneer? Uh, look, Shorty, that it is something that is vitally important. And you know, it's not something that can happen overnight. But you know, I look, for example, at, at our at our team at you know McGrath Estate Agents. We uh, one of the few businesses that have an exclusive team of auctioneers. So when you're a McGrath auctioneer, you can only auction for McGrath agents and equally McGrath agents can only use McGrath auctioneers. So that's a two-way relationship that we have there. And now, you know, John McGrath, who was a visionary in, in and around this space, you know, that's been the case for well over 20 years. And a number of other businesses now follow that lead and they have their in-house auction teams and, and they do that. And, and the benefit is uh, firstly, you know, the quality control, you know, not just anyone can be a McGrath auctioneer. You know, we don't take on people that are new to the industry and just want to have a go and all this sort of thing. You have to be experienced. You have to prove in yourself as a, a as an adequate auctioneer in that space. You have to come and, you know, do a training program with us uh, to be able to enter that space. Now, so that ensures that we have quality auctioneers, you, you know, operating within our business, which is the first element of creating the trust between the agent and the auctioneer, that the agent and the agency know they're going to get a quality auctioneer. They're not going to get someone who turns up, doesn't know what they're doing, doesn't know the legislation, doesn't know how to call an auction. So that's just an absolute baseline for us that we need to have a, a particular standard. Moving then to the relationship is then it becomes about consistency. So being the exclusive auctioneer, for example, I work in a particular geography in the St George area where I would do 90% of the St George Group's auctions, and, and it's a big group, um, and equally um, the St George auctions would represent about 90% of the auctions I do. So it kind of goes both ways. I do a little bit of Wollongong, a little bit of Sutherland Shire as well, and occasionally here and there. But the point is I'm working with agents, many of whom I've worked with for over a decade, and just like any partner, whether it be a, a romantic partner, a business partner, a, a sporting partner, you're playing doubles tennis, it's the same thing as knowing when someone's going to zig and when they're going to zag, knowing what they're going to say. Um, they know very confidently what I'm going to do and I'm going to say, and they know that I will never, you know, sell a property without checking with them first and I'm, and I'm never going to negatively engage with a buyer. And so they've got comfort around that process there and that allows them to do their job. And equally, I've got comfort in what they're doing and what they're going to say. And we've got process and procedure. And when you've worked together with, with a team um, and with an agent for a long period of time, you just build that rapport and relationship and it's very evident on the auction floor. Again, I said it earlier, no surprises. And that doesn't mean we sell everything. Don't get me wrong. But it means when we pass it in, it's passed in in a professional manner. We don't look concerned. We don't look shocked about it. We're comfortable the way we present it. We present it in a positive manner. And that way we can just, you know, again, to those people in the crowd and we deal with a lot of people that might well be uh, looking to sell their home in six months, 12 months, two years time. Uh, even a, Good professional passing can look excellent. And a lot of that comes down to relationship, trust, and um, and equally for the agents. Like I always talk about us having like a cycle of wins. You know, I work with great agents, which helps. And, and, and they sign up good quality property and they run good quality campaigns. And I come in and call good quality auctions, which is the face to the public of the result. And that enables them to list more quality property and run more quality campaigns and then they get busier and I get busier and the business is busier and we just go from strength to strength with lots of momentum. But a lot of that is, is so much of this relationship and, and whenever we have a new agent join the group, you know, I go out of my way to build that relationship as quickly as possible to spend some time with them. We do some training sessions with them around what we expect. Now, equally uh, across all the agents I work with, a lot of them operate very differently. You know, I've got some agents that are very particular on bidding increments and they'll say, right, we're not starting below a million dollars and then nothing less than $50,000 bids up to this and this, whatever. And then I've got other agents that are the opposite and they say, oh, I'm happy to start it nice and low. Lots of little bids. I want everyone to have a turn. You know, so different strategies, but the fact of the matter is that I, obviously most auctioneers can, can do it and knowing again from that relationship what that agent wants. And again, so they don't have to be concerned about it. They're not surprised. So it's, it's something, the importance of it is understated, but it's difficult to develop without just having the time and actually conducting auctions together. I, th I think there's so many aspects around that, that I love 
to he- love hearing. And, and I think the biggest thing is that trust factor, knowing you, knowing you can sort of read each other's play in relations to what needs to be the next step with, you know, particularly buyers and, and the vendor and all that key components. And that takes time, you know, of you being in that area for over 10 years and developing those relationships, developing the trust, you're almost finishing each other's sentences. Very, very, very notebooky, very, very uh, romantic. But at the same time, it works, right? And you get the best outcome for the vendors. They're happy because you, you've got that synergy. You're the trusted advisor. You're the trusted, um, you're both those trusted expert experts in your own right. Expert agent, expert auctioneer. And I think that's a, that's a beautiful synergy. Now, there's there's a couple of different components when it comes to auctions though. Like yeah, obviously you have your, your on site, which is done at the property and then you're in rooms. What would be, I mean, obviously we know the difference, but it, what's the mm. impact of the difference and explain the reasons why one would choose one of the over the other. Look, look, it's, it's, it's a hotly contested topic amongst auctionings, you know, for sure. And I'll say this, it's about, about in room auctions. In room auctions are very beneficial to the auctioneer. They can stand in one spot and call 5, 10, 15, 20 auctions all in one. So there's no arguing with the efficiency that that provides. You could also argue that can be very efficient for the agent and the agency. If you've got a busy team who have flat out back-to-back open homes on a Saturday and it suits them to do an in-room uh, event, fortnightly, monthly, whatever the case might be, I can understand why they would choose that process uh, to undertake that. So no question, great for the auctioneer, I think good for the agent. You know, like I'll do 10 auctions tomorrow, but I'm going to drive to 10 different properties. You know, that's a, that's a big part of the day. It's a process. But, you know, my personal belief, and, and certainly it's the opinion of McGrath uh, estate agents, um, are that on-site auctions are, are the best outcome for our owners. And, and that's what it comes down to. So, you know, I find that when, and there are exceptions to this, you know, if you've got a, a, a rented property and the tenants haven't presented it nicely or in a very busy main road, or there, there are some properties that are better suited uh, to in room. But if we're just taking a, a well presented house in a nice street in a popular area, you know, there's nothing better than having your buyers standing in the front or backyard, as the case might be, looking at the home, looking at the street, looking at the neighbours and, and emotionally engaging with that property one last time before they make their decision to actually bid and, and during the auction when I'm going to entice them to, to, to bid again and, and come back into the bidding, these sort of things, to be able to you know, smell, touch and taste the home um, is a real benefit. And there's one other thing, and, you know, I had an auction last night. So we do quite a few midweek auctions, but again, generally on site. So I had an auction last night at uh, Carilla, a very entry-level price point for the Sutherland Shire, uh, owner's expectations, 1.1, 1. 1, and we ended up with 19 registered bidders, which is not common at the moment, but it was very well received and a lot of first home buyers and, and the rest of it there. So uh, the bidding started at 900 and it quickly rose up to be a competition between our opening bidder uh, and, uh, and another gentleman, and uh, he was tapped out at 1.3 and we're on the market we were selling and 1.3 million dollars he was out and at that stage it looked like everybody was out and then the property was going to be sold then from the back of the crowd this young tall fella he pops in with a with a ten thousand dollar bid and then the two of them bid back and forth back and forth back and forth until it sold for one million four hundred and one thousand dollars you know back and forth so now wow. however, what, the point i'm getting to is the, in, the interesting part of it was that the person who bought it, the person who came into the bidding at $1.3 million saw it for the first time yesterday. They turned up 10 yes. minutes before the auction. They saw a lot of people around. A lot of bidders were registered. They came up and they said, right, we haven't seen it before. Can we have a look at the contract? We quite like it. Um, you know, he had his young partner with him and she was looking around and in the rooms and and, and they, were, they became very quickly engaged with the property. Um, and so... If they don't turn up, that property sells for $1.3 million. And our owners would still be very happy. You know, it was a great result regardless. If we conducted that at an in-room auction, they never come and we never get that extra $101,000 because then they've never physically seen the property at all. Now, some people say that that happens occasionally, but I find that hard to believe that people are, are bidding on things. So to have the opportunity, and it happens, you know, over my career, more times than I care to remember that someone will see it for the first time at the open home before the auction, they will register and they will come along and competitively bid through the auction. Sometimes they buy it, sometimes they're the underbidder, who again pushes the price 
to where they need to go. So from that point of view, for me, you can't get that in an in-room scenario. The other thing that concerns me about in-room auctions is that if I'm having a tough day out there in the market, every auction I turn up to inside is a fresh auction with a fresh group of people. If you're doing an in-room auction and you pass in your first four or five properties, then what about the people that are coming to bid up for the next one? True. And they're like, oh boy, I don't know if I really want to be engaging in this. Where I can pass four in on a Saturday and then go and have a belter and then the other people are none the wiser because each property stands alone as its own independent auction, not impacted by the ones that have gone before it. Um, now, mind you, when you set up an in-room auction, that's why they tend to put the better ones at the start because they want to create a bit of energy and, and those sort of things. So like I said, I can see the benefits, certainly auctioneer, agent. Yep, I get it. And then yeah, people that do those talk about, oh, the weather takes out of it and we've got great Wi-Fi in the, in the room and all the rest of it. All those little things are, are not as important as the emotional engagement and the opportunity to meet someone for the love it, love it. And, and so if you look at that, like that is so important because you've got different emotional engagement pieces. You've got different components of, of both. Yes. They they both have their pluses, but also they both have their, their minuses. And if you look back, I like how you said one last look at, you know, the place that you're about to buy. And I just want to segue from mm -hmm. that. Where do you see now the market of those places to buy or where do you see the the market going in 2024 as we as we move into a new year? Uh, Crystal ball, that's right? A tough one, <laughs> look, look, look I, I can you know it's 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 such a common question as you know, yeah. you know I, I get asked all the time. Um, I could make an articulate and and well formed case for a, a increase in prices next year and a decrease in prices next year. So that should tell you immediately that I really, <laughs> like the majority of people um, are only guessing. I remember standing in front of vendors when COVID happening and, and, you know, with my hand on my heart saying, who knows what's going to happen? You know, I think if you need to, you want to get out and this is our best offer, we take it. And then only for prices to skyrocket. Now, on the day that I said it to them, it was, it was my God's honest truth. Um, and, you know, I, I can... If I had to pick one, I, I can see, you know, they talk about the, the immigration figures and the, and the lack of supply um, coming through. So you make a case for that. But I'm a bit surprised that we haven't seen a stronger impact from the rate rises yet. I, I, I feel like I appreciate there's probably a lot of people that may be just holding on and the rest of it. But, you know, considering the, the, the increase from its lowest point till today, I'm a little bit surprised we haven't seen a bit more activity around people that, are almost having that decision taken out of their hands. But I've only seen like a few or some people may perhaps selling investments. It's all a bit tight. So we're going to sell our investment to make our life at home a bit easier and all those sort of things I could see. So um, so I might plead the fifth on that one, Shorty. As I said, yeah, I, can, <laughs> I, I, can, I, I, I could argue it either way. I, yeah, I really totally. could. And it's interesting, right? Because I was down at um, I came down to Sydney the last couple of days, and and I caught up with a with a friend, and we went to the Coogee Pavilion for dinner. On a, on a, this is on a like a I was on a Wednesday night, and it was packed. I said, "Well, oh, it looks like interest rates hasn't uh, been affected in this area. It's just like yeah. it's, well, I, and, and look, obviously there are there are different pockets, and, and people tighten yeah. the strings in different ways. But I can tell you, that, you know, in 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 a flip. Example to that, you mentioned earlier that I've, that I've got the, the Bowlerama, our Temping Bowling Alley, which is mm. located in Weatherall Park, you know, very much in the heart of Western Sydney. It's in that Fairfield LGA, which is like number one for mortgage distress in the country and, and all the rest of it. And um, it's quite evident to us there that, you know, things around discretionary spending, uh, kids' birthday parties, uh, little James this year might have a party at home or might not have a party. Or if he has a bowling party, we're just going to invite not the whole class, but just 10 kids along. And so, you know, to compare that business um, to last year and the year before, big parties, everyone was having them. There was a lot, you know, big spend per party. Um, that is, you know, we can see that that has dropped. And this is not real estate, but it speaks to the economy, which oh, is, you know, people in some areas, are, you know, if it doesn't have to be spent, you know, and be interesting summer holidays coming up because, mm. you know, like typically at the bowling alley, summer's not that busy. We're, we're more of a winter type thing. Um, and often in summertime, a lot of people go away. So during those holidays, it's not very busy. I'm wondering whether or not less people might be going away um, and that we might be seeing a few more people hanging around locally. So, but you're right, there are some areas and some businesses that are absolutely flying. Mm. Um, and other areas, you know, I was speaking to a cafe owner the other day who just said, 
you know, they were significantly down just in general, those sort of things. So it's uh, it's very, very interesting out there at the moment. It feels very too speed. feels like, you know, the, the, the middle is really being impacted very heavily. So it's a um, yeah tricky time for sure. Yeah, it is. It is definitely. So we have a, uh, on our show, we have a 60 second quick quiz that we uh, love to share with all our guests. A um, bunch of quick questions. Are you ready to play? Let's have a go. All right, cool. Favorite movie? Uh, Field of Dreams. Oh, I love it. Uh, favorite food? Um, anything really nice with my wife at a lovely restaurant with a bottle of wine. I don't mind the cuisine. You're a good man. Uh, favorite holiday clearly, destination? Clearly. <laughs> um, I, I love going to a football World Cup. I've been to a bunch of them, but Fiji with the family. Beautiful. Do you have a morning routine? Not really. Okay. Do you have an evening routine? Not really. Okay, no, good. My, 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 my calendar's all over the place. So I, seldomly are two days the same. Love it. Love it. Uh, do you have a most embarrassing moment? Um, probably too many to, uh, to think <laughs> probably something on a probably something on a sporting field. I, I think when I was a young guy, I was a goalkeeper, and I once wrapped myself around a goalpost and, and tore my groin muscle and conceded the goal all at the same time. So Ouch. that would have to be close. Ouch. If you could choose five inspirational people to have dinner with, who would they be? They could be dead or alive. <sighs> um, big football fan. I'd love to break bread with Harry Kuehl. Uh Have a little little chat to him. Um, this will sound brown nosing a little bit, but I spent a bit of time with John McGrath, and I always find what he has to say to be very, very interesting. Um, so that would be good. Uh, I mean, imagine sitting down with a US president, dead, dead or alive, take your pick from any side of the political spectrum. They would just have some unbelievable stories to tell. How many have I got left? Two seats left? Two more. I'd invite the old man back for a feed. We get dad along. Mm-hmm. And. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I'll have to. I'll get Ben Folds along. The musician. He's my favourite musician, Ben Folds. And I think he'd be a good dinner company as well. Love it. Fantastic. Now, if you were Prime Minister for the day, what's one thing that you would change? Uh, Get rid of stamp duty. All right. Fantastic. And what's your best piece of advice? Uh, Be genuine. Don't say anything to anyone that you wouldn't be happy for someone else to hear you say. And it's yeah. important for the young kids these days with so much electronic communication. We talk to our kids about it all the time. Don't don't text or, or say anything that you wouldn't be comfortable with mum and dad reading, your, your, your headmaster at school reading, your teacher, and whoever else might be involved. So that, that would be, it just makes life a bit easier. Yeah, I love it. Fantastic. And uh, what's, uh, what's the best way that people can reach out, follow your journey and get in contact? Um, they're welcome to jump onto my Instagram if they like, Stu Ritchie one, um, to have a look. I'm happy for anyone to, I'm sure you can put my phone number in the bio. If any, particularly, I guess, young auctioneers, you know, it's one of my favorite things to do. I had a young fella in the car with me last Saturday to, you know, spend time with guys and girls that want to become auctioneers and, and to see what a day in the life of an auctioneer looks like. And a lot of them get to the end of the day and they're really tired and they haven't even called any auctions. They're just, you know, being in the car. So, um, so yeah, so from that point of view, I, I do love, you know, working with and training uh, younger, young in terms of experience, uh, option is to impart my very specific knowledge set. Fantastic. Mate, Stu, really appreciate your time, energy, expertise, and knowledge uh, on the show today. Mate, thank you so, so much. It's been my pleasure, mate. It's been lovely to see you. Nice chat. Thanks, mate.